welcome to everyone to our service of worship on this Good Friday for your worship at home, wherever you may be. And we're grateful that you have joined uh, together in prayer at this important time in our history. And we do hope that this service of worship and reflection brings you courage and strength to the journey ahead. We gather at a crossroads. We know and not what lies ahead. We know that we will encounter betrayal and pain and loneliness, but we will go willingly because we go together with Christ who has walked this way before us. Let us continue together on our journey with courage and hope and gratitude. Let us pray. O God of the journey's end, we know that any day can bring both sadness and hope. We are formed and transformed by experiencing the good in each day and courageously face the difficulties ahead. Draw us near to each other as you draw us nearer to you, so we may find strength, courage, and grace for living into these challenging days while pandemic rages. Amen. Our song for Good Friday is Psalm 22. Begin with the song refrain. Don't be afraid, my love is stronger, my love is stronger than your fear. Don't be afraid, my love is stronger, and
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the cry of my distress? Oh my God, I cry out in the daytime, but you do not answer. At night also, but I get no relief. But you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. They called to you and you rescued them. In In you you they they put put their their trust, trust, and you did not disappoint them. them. But I am a worm, less than human. An object object of derision, an outcast of the people. All those who see me laugh to scorn, they curl their lips and toss their heads, saying, You trusted in God for deliverance. If God cares for you, let God rescue you. But you are the one who took me out of the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you you have I I depended from my birth. Even Even from from my my mother's mother's womb, womb, you you have have been been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is close at hand. And there There is is no one to help me. Many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They They open open wide their mouths at me. Like, like a, a ravenous, ravenous roaring lion. My life pours out like water. All my, my bones are out of joint. My heart has melted like wax within my breast. My, my mouth, mouth is parched as dry clay. My tongue clings to my palate. I my lie in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. The, the wicked, wicked hem me in on every, on every side. side. They bind my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones while they stand staring, gloating over me. They divide my garments among themselves. They cast lots for my clothing. Do not stand far off from me, O God. You are my helper. Come quickly to my rescue. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the mauling of dogs. Save me from the lion's mouth my afflicted soul from the horns of the wild cattle. Then I will declare your name to my people. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Don't be afraid. My love is stronger. My love is stronger than your fear. Don't be afraid. My love is stronger, and I have promised, promised to be always near. Our Good Friday story always brings us face to face with the worst experiences that can confront human beings reminding us of our shared fragility. Betrayal, ignorance, misunderstanding, political conspiracy, loneliness, cowardice, hatred, judgment, mockery, violence, and death. As Christians, it is a story we retell every year leading up to the central experience of our faith, resurrection and renewal of life. But there are no shortcuts for us to get to that experience of hope and joy. We have to go through those tough experiences with our Lord Jesus Christ, who willingly walked into Jerusalem knowing it would lead to his suffering and death. But this year, we don't need this reminder about human frailty, human sinfulness at times, as the whole world lives through this pandemic, humbly humbling us as a human race in ways that have never been experienced before. One of the downsides of the globalization of our economies and social experience. We are understanding ourselves as a one world community in a new way, as we're confronted by the insatiable spread of the COVID-19 virus 
and the demands upon all of us to be more aware and responsible for our personal actions and participation in helping to heal fragile bodies and lives. Some people are experiencing this as an opportunity for all of us and our societies to take a long pause, to reflect, reflect deeply on our frenetic lifestyles and our overconsumption that has been so damaging to God's creation. Many are reflecting on how past tragedies have led to great renewals in faith and have discovered poetry and sacred writings that bring meaning to this time of great uncertainty and fear. The Wall Street Journal has published an article by Robert Nicholson entitled, A Coronavirus Great Awakening? With the subtitle, Sometimes the Most Important Ingredient for Spiritual Renewal is a Cataclysmic event. Nicholson cites the religious revival and upsurge in church attendance that took place in the aftermath of World War II. Since then, and contrary to the human experience through most of our history, we've become complacent and trivialized. We thought we had conquered nature. Life had become easy and totally under our control. We thought there was no need for God. But he says the pandemic has humbled the country and opened millions of eyes to this risky universe once more. We of the 20th century have been particularly spoiled for the men and women of the Old Testament, the ancient Greeks, and all our ancestors down to the 17th century betray in their philosophy and their outlook a terrible awareness of the chanciness of human life and the precarious nature of man's experience in this risky universe. End of quote. I was privileged on Wednesday evening to be, part, to be invited to take part in the Jewish Passover. This year, a Zoom Seder, hosted again by Rabbi Steve Garten, to learn again from our ancestors in the faith. In attendance were family members of Steve's from across the U.S. and Canada, including my daughter Jess and son-in-law Micah and grandchildren, who one day will get to ask the child's innocent question. Why do we celebrate the Passover every year? Of course, this year it was so poignant to hear again the story of the Exodus, of the Hebrew people um, escaping from their slavery in Egypt, the suffering that they endured in wandering in the wilderness through hunger and thirst, plagues of all kinds, and loss of faith. And yet, through the spiritual leadership of Moses and Aaron and his sister Miriam, they learn to rely again on their God and to begin to trust that God is with them in the hard times when the future looks bleak. Sometimes all they had to hold on to was their faith, their trust in the promises of God to accompany them to keep them strong, to keep their community together. This is such an important slogan for us to take these days, to give us hope. We are all in this together. United Church blogger Reverend Steve Fetter from Toronto, who organizes the United in Learning webinars for, for our church, has this to say about Good Friday. Good Friday is the day when all our easy answers fall flat. Evil wins, hope dies. We can't just get on with it by ourselves. And Good Friday faces us with the consequences of failure when we imagine we should try. 
Easter is not just a celebration of new life. It's a celebration of new life that overcomes death. It's a celebration of new life that emerges after the worst of all possible tragedies. It's a celebration of power that snatches hope out of the worst of defeats. It's a celebration of the power that inspires us to keep getting on with life as it ought to be like. So I imagine that all of us are grappling with both the bigger meaning of the tragedy of these days of COVID-19, perhaps as it may affect our own families, something we will no doubt be grappling with for the rest of our lives, especially for the children and youth amongst us. But right now, it is a daily task to acknowledge and confront our deep, deepest fears of our vulnerability to illness, loneliness, poverty, grief, and even death itself, to bring our fear and pain to God in Christ. And certainly as someone who is in that over 60 category, I'm often deeply aware of uh, my own fragility. And so, how do you keep your hope alive? For it is hope and faith that will save us, that will inspire the visions and the courage in us that will be needed as God renews our lives and heals this world from deep within. In these days of fragility, grief, and fear, May each of you find the hope that lies within you, the spirit of Christ that still lives and breathes within you, nourishing your own spirits with courage, healing, and love that will never die. That is the goodness and the hope of this day called Good Friday, the blessing of the cross that Jesus endured. As we turn our hearts towards this holy light and prayer, I leave you with this blessing uh, written by Jan Richardson. It's called Sign of the Winding Sheet, and it's based on John 19, verse 40. When they took the body of Jesus and they wrapped it in, the sp in spices and linen cloths. We never would have wished it to come to this. Yet we call these moments holy as we hold you. Holy the tending, holy the winding, holy the leaving as in the living. Holy the silence, holy the stillness, holy the turning and returning to the earth. Blessed is the one who came in the name Blessed is the one who laid himself down. Blessed is the one emptied for us. Blessed is the one wearing the shroud. Holy the waiting. Holy the breathing. Holy the shadows and gathering night. Holy the darkness. Holy the hours. Holy the hope and turning toward the light. Amen. The Passion of Christ according to John's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 15 to 27. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. 
Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire, fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If you have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, and he said, I am not. I invite you now into a time of prayer, confession, and uh, praying for the people in the world. How have we forsaken you, O God? Where there is suffering, we turn our eyes. We may not take seriously the threat of this pandemic. Where there is need, we turn our hearts away and stop listening. And yet we know that you, O Christ, are among the sick, the lonely, the hungry, and the homeless. O Holy One, we pray as this candle is lit. are being devastated by the COVID virus, those who have become ill, those who work tirelessly to bring healing, and those who have lost the battle, perhaps dying alone, praying for families who cannot draw near to a loved one. Holy One, we pray. Oh God, have mercy. Oh Pray for those whose stomachs ache with hunger, O Holy One. For those affected by the closing of social programs, the limited dowers of food banks, the food programs at school for our children. O Holy One, we pray. O Seigneur, pitié. O Seigneur, pitié. O Seigneur, pitié. We pray for those who have become unemployed, laid off, wondering if they can hang on to their businesses, what the future holds for the economy. O Holy One, we pray. for our children, learning lessons about life and death and human frailty too soon in their lives, for the losses they suffer being torn from schools, daycares, playgrounds, programs and museums, and friends, praying for families of all generations that struggle to cope with the emotional and financial resources they have, 
praying for those with loved ones in long-term care or retirement homes with worries in their hearts. O Holy One, we pray. O God, have mercy, O God. Pray for those suffering depression, increased addiction, mental illness, compounded by these days of anxiety and social isolation. O Holy One, we pray. be your hands, Holy One, reaching out to heal the hurting of this world. Help us to be your arms, Holy One, embracing the sorrow and offering comfort to those in our own circle of care, in person or virtually. Help us to be your feet, Holy One, walking in compassion with those who suffer. Amen. John 19, 1-16 Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the priests saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him according to that law. He ought to die because he was claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power them to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the palace called the Stone of Payment, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of the preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate answered them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed them over to him to be crucified. Continue to read from John 19, verse 16b to 22. They took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, 
What I have written, I have written. John 19, 23 to 30. When the soldiers had crucified Christ, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took a tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture said. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots, and that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus, where his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all has, was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put it on a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. invite you to pray. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, some of your followers stayed with you to the end. end. We, we want to have, have that kind of faith. faith. Give, Give us the strength, strength to see things through, even, even in the midst of darkness, darkness danger, sickness, sickness, and with, with the, the challenges, challenges that still lay, lay before us, whatever, whatever they be. may be. Give, Give us hope, hope in the possibilities of life eternal. eternal. Amen. Continuing with our reading from John's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 31 to 42. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. And the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, and they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled, None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look upon, look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, 
though a secret one because of his fears of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and he removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to, came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. You are invited to sing along, were you there when they crucified my Lord?
And so our service of worship, our prayers and intercessions, hearing this story, the passion of Jesus Christ, has come to an end. And there's much for us to reflect upon. There is so much lament and grief in our hearts, in our communities, and throughout the world. And so I invite you to take the time after the service to tend passionately to your own wounds, knowing that within that pain, the God that dwells with you in spirit, that hope will be born in you, and that your compassion will be free and be used in the world. So I invite you to continue with Good Friday and Holy Saturday and prepare yourself for the surprising possibilities of the resurrection of Christ and the new life that God will continue to bring us that we celebrate on Easter morning.